Hi, everyone. This is Biz Kush. Uh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm super excited about resharing this uh, next episode with you. This one comes from 2019. So back from the archives, uh, episode number 92 with Jennifer O'Sullivan. Uh, but before I uh, talk about that, I just wanted to say that I am have really enjoyed the break and gearing up to start scheduling new guests and interviews for the next season and um, brainstorming topics that feel relevant for this next season that I can talk about or I can bring guests on to talk about. So if you have thoughts or ideas or want some input or you just want to talk to me, I have... Uh, some free 15-minute spots available. And you can find those in the show notes for this episode. You can also go to my social media link on Instagram. And that link, if you go and click on my bio, you will find the link there for scheduling a free 15-minute chat with me. So I would love to talk to you if you want to have some input on the podcast for next season or want to just hang out with me for 15 minutes. I've also upgraded the free gift that you get when you sign up for my newsletter. So um, you will receive three video prompts to help you awaken your wise woman. So if you're interested in that, also, again, in the show notes, there will be a link to sign up for the newsletter or you can go to Instagram, click on my bio, and you will find a link there for all the things that I do and you can receive. So uh, yeah, I, I'm super proud of those. I am so, uh, I have been very uncomfortable about doing videos. And so I'm, I've been stretching myself trying to put myself out there more visually. So uh, I'd love any feedback on those as well. So the reason I'm sharing this episode with Jennifer O'Sullivan, a yogi IFS practitioner and all around lovely woman, um, is because sometimes creating space for awareness for change, for doing things differently. Sometimes we need a little support with that. We need some practices to help us tap into the wisest part of ourselves that we can bring into situations so that instead of just jumping in and reacting, we have space to respond, to be present, and to be fully connected. And Jennifer talks about all the the pieces she brings into her, um, into her life and into her healing, but also things that she shares with her clients. So we're talking about yin yoga. We're talking about mindfulness, Chinese medicine, and IFS, internal family system. So it's a lot. We cover a lot, but it's also just a um, a lovely conversation with Jennifer. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, reach out if you want some input on season three of the podcast. All right, here's my conversation with Jennifer O'Sullivan. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for being a guest on the Woman Warriors podcast. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Oh, I'm excited to start our conversation. But before we do, could you tell us a little bit about you and your business? Okay. Uh, Well, I am a yoga and meditation, specifically mindfulness meditation in the Washington, D.C. area. And I've been teaching classes and workshops and co-leading and leading teacher training programs for about 15 years now, Mm. all in the metro area. Wow. (laughs) And what inspired you to be on this journey of learning about 
mindfulness and yoga and Chinese medicine and internal family systems, all of those things. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a hodgepodge. And I'll just say that that stuff didn't all come at once. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, right. Um, I first got interested in yoga uh, back in my mid-20s. I have a history of uh, mental... I, I don't want to say mental disorder because that's not right, but I had a, mm -hmm. I had a history with mental health, let's say that, uh, yeah. all the way back in high school. Mm. And I'll use a little bit of parts language now, but this is, this is me 20 years later talking about it. Back in the day, I, I wouldn't have had this, this vocabulary to talk about my experience back then. But mm -hmm. one thing that emerged back in high school for me was is that I have a, a manager that is very, very astute at picking up when I'm really not doing well and is very, very motivated to help me in luckily very skillful ways. So this is a part of me that has um, kept me away from drugs and alcohol when everybody around me was was choosing that, um, has, has kept me really afloat. And so I'm very grateful that I have this part because all the way back in high school, I self-elected to get intensive treatment for some depression wow. and uh, suicidal ideation. So that's that's kind of the, the foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So fast forward um, 10 or so years, 11 or so years, I'm in my 20s, I'm living up here in DC, and I'm working at a dot com, you know, right around the time when the dot com bubble burst. <laughs> wow. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a young person, getting laid off and, and dealing with things that you never would imagine. And, mm -hmm. and I started to see this manager clicked in and started to see things were, were heading downhill again mm -hmm. and, uh, and started to seek out support. And, uh, you know, I was going to therapy, uh, therapist was saying, go to the gym. Mm -hmm. Gym wasn't really that helpful for me because I was still pretty good at ruminating and, and worst case scenarioing yep. <laughs> while on the machines, <laughs> like <laughs> counting out reps wasn't enough to get my mind off of it. And the, and the sort of endorphin high didn't last long enough for, to be really meaningful for me. Mm. I had a friend who was loaning me her hypnosis tapes, which were really guided relaxation tapes. And I generally had my ears perked up for support and, by this point, I was taking classes at a climbing gym, you know, climbing classes. And a guy oh, wow. in my class said, you know, I really like this yoga class that they offer in the evenings. And I was like, really? Because my impression of yoga was that it was really low impact exercise. And yeah. I was having trouble really seeing the connection. But he said, no, no, it, it, it helps with my mental game. And I was like, oh, really? That sounded interesting. And because I was kind of tuned in to stuff like that. I was like, Oh, tell me more about that. And so he was talking about the breath and I was like, what, what's this with the breath? And so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my interest was sufficiently peaked. So I was able to get this idea uh, kind of poo pooing yoga out of my mind that it was not that great exercise. And instead went into it with a totally different perspective. And after the first class, I was completely hooked. And I want to say though, before we get too far in that, um, the style of yoga that I stumbled across was was really unique and that it was was gentle. It was a lot of uh, more somatic developmental mm. movement. So it wasn't a lot of warrior ones and things like that. And it's not that we didn't do that, but a lot of it was on the floor. And the teacher was taking us through a lot of before and after. So notice how you feel now. Okay, then we would do some poses. Okay, now notice how you feel. Mm. And that, that before and after picture was... I know now was kind of giving me a really in the moment perspective on how you can actually take care of yourself. You can do things that positively impact your well-being in the moment and you can see that for yourself. And that mm. was really revelatory for me. Um, well, I felt very grounded after these practices and uh, really connected to myself, really embodied in a way that I had never been before. And so I just, I just kept going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that whole just tuning into the body in a safe environment, you know, where you're really just exploring it without like, what's wrong with me? Why am I feeling like this? 
just like, okay, notice what's happening now, I would imagine was very different too, you know, for you at that time. It was because if you had asked me in any regular environment, what's happening now? And if I were being honest, it would have been, well, this is what I'm saying to myself. And this is what I think about this moment. And it would never have been um, skillful or helpful. Um, You know, I was, I was in a place where I was marinating in Mm. negativity and doom and gloom scenarios. And so this gave me a reprieve from that while also showing me something else, that there's a different way of being. And it Mm. it was amazing. And uh, I stuck with it. The Mm -hmm. teacher went on to open her own studio in Old Town, Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And I followed her there because it was near my house. And so I started taking a couple times a week at this point. And after a couple of years, she said she was going to offer teacher training. And I didn't jump into teacher training because I wanted to teach other people, at least not initially. I was very intrigued. You know, this is how good I feel. And this is how beneficial this has been going twice a week for a couple of years. What would it be like to really integrate this into my life? Could I could I basically up level this experience? Mm-hmm. And so that's why I went into the training because at the time you couldn't find uh, depth practices uh, outside of that training environment. Mm-hmm. So so I jumped in wholeheartedly trying to understand why is this working this way? What is it really doing? How can I amplify it? Uh, mm-hmm. You know and and be really, really proactive about my mental health. Mm. Um, As it happened, I didn't get a lot of those answers. And I think some of it is that a lot of what we know about yoga and mental health and embodiment practices and mindfulness, that information is a lot newer Mm. um, in more recent years. So I didn't have a good picture coming out of that. Why? But I definitely had resources now to, to, work with these teachings on my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, you, you've talked about your own mental health and depression being a part of that. But I think depression and anxiety can kind of go hand in hand, sort of the worry, 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 then leading you mm-hmm. into the spiral of, you know, feeling bad about yourself or where you are or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, how did yoga really help you, but also how does it help your clients manage the mental health? Now that you know more about the why, <laughs> why does it? Yeah, it's a, I think, you know, they're, they're studying this a lot. And um, I still get a sense when I read the literature that it does work. And there's still a bit of a, a question about, well, why does it work? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I still get the impression that they haven't quite pinpointed that yeah. that why in a really strong way. Mm-hmm. You know, then you look at neuroscience and that starts to illuminate some of the reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it, it starts with the being in your body aspect, especially with the yoga practices, a little bit more so than the mindfulness practices, that feeling sensation and tapping into that sensory motor nervous system is really grounding for me because oftentimes when I'm in a depressed state or an anxiety for sure, it's, it's so head based and oh, yeah. I feel almost disembodied from my body. And mm. when I'm in a real bad space, I don't eat. I just kind of forget to take care of myself and things like that. So, um, that kind of neglectful behaviors around the body, like it's not even there. So, doing things that pull me back into this grounded felt sense of me, I find incredibly supportive. Mm -hmm. Um, And then of course that, that being in the moment and training your mind, training your mind to let go of the ruminating has also been really impactful for me because while my thoughts tend to be a negative downhill spiral, I do think that they probably are anxiety uh, in so much as it's, it's the same thoughts over and over and over again that I can't let go of. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, being able to use mindfulness, mindfulness methods to say, you know what, not now, that's not what I'm thinking about. And, and turning away from it and going back to something neutral or positive 
has has been a tremendous benefit for me. It's I think of it as you know agency over your mind. I, I think in our culture we value self control and self discipline, but it's very external. Mm. Um, we don't typically learn as children, although I'm, I'm hopeful that this next generation is learning this. But you know, it takes some practice to shift your mind away from distractions or ruminations or um, really negative self-talk to something else, whether it's neutral or positive or even just getting your work done during the day. So, you know, the mindfulness teachers say we can train ourselves to do this just like you would train up your muscles. Right, right. Yeah. And that our brains can shift from this, you know, whatever state to a more mindful state if we Mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. 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 Um, I was thinking about when you were talking about, uh, really tuning into your body, just getting a a greater sense of what was happening there kind of one helps you ground, but also helps you really tune into what's happening for you in that moment, Mm -hmm. which I think I'm going to segue into internal family systems a little bit, because I feel like a lot of that process has to do with tuning into the parts of you and where they reside in your body and at least on some level sort of tuning into that more somatic experience of like okay where is this manager part showing up like do Mm -hmm. i feel are my shoulders hunched up or is my chest really tight or whatever that might be and that really can help give you a greater sense of all those parts yeah i think so i started learning about IFS just a couple of years ago, I finished level one training earlier this year. Mm. And I did the, the year long program. So I've, I've been very immersed in IFS the past couple of years. Yeah. And one of the things that did impress me with IFS was this, you know, at the very beginning of the work, you, you know, you sit down in the chair, and, and you're, you're in the position of the client or the patient. And the therapist will ask you, you know, where does this part show up in your body, like you were saying? And to me, that's like, oh, of course it would be in your body because I've been so steeped in these yoga methods for so long. I noticed that some of my fellow students w- were a little newer to that concept. But for me, it was it was a really natural synergy. And um, now that I've been using IFS, uh, the model and the language to reflect back on my yoga practice, it's been really interesting to see how, oh, you know, I frequently carry a lot of tension in my upper back and shoulders, and I've been able to start mapping that to consistent parts. Mm. Um, Oh, that's that part showing up again. And I didn't have a language for that before learning IFS. So that's been, it's been really sweet to, to bring this um, trained up, I'm not going to say it's natural because I did train it up to listen to my body and then to take it another step further with IFS and, and, and in a way personify those experiences. Yeah. What do they want? What is this trying to tell me? Um, Can I get it to step back? And the stepping back process of IFS is like, whoa, I, I, that is amazing to me. <laughs> that still just gets me really lit up every time the parts are like, okay. And then that tension softens like right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I would imagine, yes, having the experience of, of being a yoga teacher would have, would help even more with the whole internal family systems process of the body work too. Yeah. Um, Talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, your, I don't know if it's your specialty, but I know something that you know a lot about is yin yoga. And Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to know more about how it's different. Like, what is it? How is it different? (laughs) Why, why is, does this feel like an important uh, modality to you? Yeah. So interrupt me if I get too professorial, (laughs) (laughs) but I, I have to, I, I tend to find it helpful to to present yin alongside what it isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you think of a lot of yoga classes these days, especially these days, they're they're very vigorous. Um, you know, you've got people including weights now and and heat, and there's a very um, dynamic 
active, uh, in a way, goal-oriented take on yoga these days that's very, very concerned with physical strength and being able to do more postures and, and things like that. So we would say, uh, to use the language of Chinese energetic medicine, we would say that that's very young, very dynamic, very type A, very generative, uh, get things done kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And we need that, absolutely. And, and certainly we can think of people in our own lives who probably need a little more of that. But the general sense is that most of us are in that kind of mode more often than not. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, in some extremes, if they're not sleeping, they're in that young, dynamic, type A mode all the time. Mm. And Chinese medicine and even yoga tradition will say that uh, that's depleting. And, you know, we know from Western science that stress is the cause of most of our major illnesses. And stress is a direct result of being in a constant young state all the time. So we need to be more deliberate about including um, calming, passive, receptive um, work into our lifestyle and also into our yoga practice. So that's where yin yoga comes into play, where it's a, it's a passive, mostly floor-based style of yoga where you hold, um, you know, light shapes on the floor for three to five minutes and then you'll switch to something else. Mm. And so it, it gets you in this mode where you're still in your body and you're still doing something, however glacial it might be, but you are able then to um, settle, get quiet, and and shift into more of an observational mode rather than a doing mode. Mm -hmm. And so it's very balancing. And the the Taoists would say, you know, you need a real nice even balance of both yin and yang aspects to your life and your work and your practice. Um, but we just tend to skew so strongly towards the yang mm -hmm. that you bring up a practice like yin yoga as a, as a kind of antidote to that. Mm. Um, really all yoga should be a mix of both, but it's just, we've trended towards this one, one sided view so yeah. much lately. Yeah. Well, it's like, I think just our culture in general, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. do it 110%, you know, really, yeah. Push yourself to the extreme, whatever, Work yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No pain, no gain. <laughs> no pain, no gain. Exactly, exactly. But this is much more, sounds more restorative. It sounds, mm -hmm. yeah, calming. Um, and really, as you said, sort of this focus on where you are in that moment too, right? Like just being with that one pose for three to five minutes, you're really paying attention to your body in that moment, I would think. <laughs> Ideally, yeah. And I think that's why, you know, the yin, you mentioned restorative yoga. There's a, for those who aren't as familiar with all the different terms in yoga, there is a style of yoga called restorative yoga that's even more passive because mm. you use a lot more props. Um, so it's a very, very, very comfortable practice. Mm -hmm. Yin is a little edgy. We mm -hmm. are still playing around with sensation a bit. So you're kind of playing around with, well, what is my, my edge of tolerance? And then we can use that time in the poses to resource ourselves or capacitate ourselves to um, experience and be okay with a wider bandwidth of input. So it's not altogether comfortable while you're in it, but instead of being really um, rejecting of that sense of discomfort, you know, can we, to use IFS terminology, can we get curious about mm. what's happening? And when you kind of light up that curiosity, it, I think it definitely does drop you into the present moment. Mm -hmm. And be, being curious is a very present moment activity, right? And yeah. so there's yeah. a lot to explore. You know, the poses are sens sensation rich, so you can... Um, you know, you get a sense of like, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> you know, you notice, yeah. you know, mm, why is that so tight? Or, you know, oh, look, it's getting a little more relaxed now and, and starting to soften and now it's dissipating. Or, oh, look at that. It's getting a little stronger. I wonder if I should back off a little bit. And so you kind of go through this little dialogue with yourself, mm -hmm. um, trying to navigate the experience. And I think that's, first, it's really empowering to 
to have those conversations with yourself, but it does get you in the present moment. Mm -hmm. The other thing I like about yin is that I do practice it as a mindfulness practice. So when I'm on my own, you know, after maybe a minute or so of navigating the sensation, I'll drop back into mindfulness practices. You know, can I stay with my breath even though I'm in this circumstance? Or um, can I explore the thoughts that come and go while I stay here? So Mm -hmm. in that sense for me, yin yoga is just another way that I practice meditation. (laughs) Yeah, I would imagine. And it's interesting because, um, you know, my, my specialty is working with adults who have ang- a lot of anxiety, stress, overwhelm, mm-hmm. and often, well, my <laughs> my message is, you know, it is learning to manage your an- anxiety effectively. It's just learning to tolerate the discomfort, right? It's like getting curious about it, but being okay that you're not feeling great. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That That being okay with not feeling great Mm-hmm. is essential learning, I think, for life. Mm-hmm. Um, and yin yoga trains that up really nicely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, because, again, yeah, the same sort of non-judgment and, mm-hmm. yeah, curiosity and all of that. So I'd like to talk a little bit, too, about the role that Chinese medicine plays in your work. I know you, I listen to think a podcast interview, or maybe it was something on your website, I forget which, but, and you talk (laughs) about meridians and what, like, I know very little about Chinese medicine and healing. And so if you wouldn't mind, maybe a little (laughs) overview. Sure. Um, So I got into this because it's, it's kind of goes along with yin yoga that um, rather than hewing real strongly with Indian yoga philosophy. Yin yoga is a little more grounded in Taoist energetic practices, of which Chinese medicine is one of many practices. So um, so that's how I got interested in it. And, um, you know, the first thing to understand is that within our bodies, we, we all have a life force. In yoga, they call it prana. Um, so some people might be familiar with that term. And then in Taoism, it's called qi. Mm. And so this is a, a pulse of energy. Uh, some call it a vapor that is omnipresent throughout the body, but it tends to gather in particular uh, rivers throughout the body. And these rivers would be called meridians. And actually, there are some larger ones called extraordinary vessels, but... Um, We tend not to work with them as much in yin yoga. So the meridians uh, run through specific landmarks in the body, particularly organ pairs, and that's how they get their names. So the heart meridian uh, runs through the heart and also the small intestine. The kidney meridian runs up the inside seam of the leg, but also into the torso and into the bladder and into the kidneys and, and throughout the rest of the torso. So these Meridians get their names for the organs, the primary organs that they support. And what they're doing is uh, providing the conduit whereby this chi flows through the body and also to the organs to nourish them. Mm -hmm. And each organ pair, they're they're organized by yin and yang pairs. So kidneys go with bladder, liver goes with gallbladder, and so forth. So they they get paired up. Mm -hmm. And each organ has its western physiological function that that we think of but from the chinese view they also attribute to the organs an energetic function a psycho-emotional function a spiritual function so each organ has um, an extended role that we don't give it in in allopathic medicine so Mm. For instance, the kidneys are said to store your life force energy, this chi. It's also said to store a type of chi that you're born with called jing. Hmm. And jing is a special kind of chi that you, you, you can think of it as a gas tank. But when the gas tank runs out, then that's it. You don't get any more. So oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> and so, you know, the idea being that 
you know, as we go through life, um, you know, we grow and, and then we, you know, hit middle age and then we start our slow decline to old age, we're slowly using up this jing. Mm. And certain lifestyle habits can um, cause us to use more jing more quickly um, than others. So the idea being here is that we need to do everything that we can, lifestyle, diet, um, energy practices, physical practices, mental stimulation as well. We need to do everything that we can to conserve this jing because once it's gone, we're effectively dead. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and this pairs up really nice. I always use this example because it's so relatable because we know that stress is depleting and that's true in Chinese medicine too. Stress um, harms the kidneys, depletes jing. Mm. And this is something that the ancients knew 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Stress is a killer. Mm -hmm. And we know that now. And when you look at stress patterns and what it does to the body, even from the Western view, all the different processes that kick in are, are kind of this process of deterioration. Right. And, um, you know, overuse, what you get when you when you use something too much before you replenish. And so they, they kind of line up really nicely, like take care of your kidneys and be really conservation minded with your lifestyle and you will live longer. And that matches up really well with our views on stress, like do things to manage your self care and your lifestyle and you will live longer because you won't be developing all these other issues. So, right, right. Um, yeah. So that's that's the example I always use because it's so relatable. But this is true of all the different organ pairs throughout the body. So the liver relates to our emotionality. Um, the heart kind of governs all of our emotions. Um, you know, so it's, there's a lot of other things going on from the Chinese view. Mm -hmm. So what you can then do is either work with a practitioner, like when you go to an acupuncturist, they're kind of diagnosing you against a, a lot of different criteria. They're looking for symptomology, just like any doctor would. But they're not just looking at your physical symptoms. They're looking at your your overall constitution, your demeanor, the way that you talk, um, the pallor of your skin, the kinds of things you're reporting going on in your life. And then they're going to treat the different organs um, based on, on what they're seeing. Mm. And they do that, coming back to the meridians, by fine-tuning the flow of chi that flows through those channels. Hmm. Interesting. And so <laughs> how for you, like I feel like we could talk about Chinese medicine for a whole episode, so maybe we'll do that <laughs> another time. Sure. <laughs> but how do all of these things come together for you in your practice and with clients, but also for yourself? Like how do you know, IFS, Chinese medicine, yin yoga. I mean, I can sort of see it all coming together. Um, <laughs> but I mean, for one thing, like I was thinking about chi, although it's a little bit different, but thinking about that concept of self, right? That like, mm -hmm. there is this energy within us, this, this part of us that sort of helps us manage all these other parts. But I don't know if that's really relevant. But anyhow, how do you incorporate all these things to help us live healthier, less stressful lives? Yeah. Well, it starts first with inquiry. I think everything starts with inquiry. And, you know, in many ways, I see yoga, Chinese medicine, IFS, they're, they're different doorways into getting to know yourself better. Hmm. And so, um, it's, it's a kind of organic process. Um, I use my yin practice for myself as a response tool for what I'm picking up through other channels. So, for instance, when I work with my IFS coach, um, you know, some stuff, we're working on some stuff, we're getting ready to start working with an exile. And so I'm starting to tune in really closely to the ways that managers are showing up around that, um, some firefighters, and I'm starting to sense like how might this work tax my system and can I be a little bit more proactive about supporting my health while going through this emotional process, right? Mm. And so um, so based on what I discover in, in kind of keeping track of and really paying attention and, and getting curious, there's that self-energy, mm -hmm. um, about what 
what might happen and, and what tends to come up, then I can match that back to some of those uh, symptoms and figure out well which organ is most likely to be taxed or get into disharmony. Or if it is disharmony, disharmonious, how might it impact the work? And then I can do yin poses that specifically support mm. um, those organs so that they may remain robust while doing this other deep work. Wow. Um, or I might even go to my acupuncturist and say, here's what's going on. Here's how I'm feeling. What do you think? Do we think we should work on liver right now <laughs> or right. Um, heart or lungs or whatever? And and so I, I will solicit support from some of my other care team, as it were. Right. Um, right. So so I use the yin poses as as a response. It's a tool rather than um, something. And, you know, sometimes stuff comes up when I'm doing yin poses. I'm like, oh, isn't that interesting? But but mostly it's coming out through my meditation practice and my inquiry practice at the beginning of my day. Hmm. Um, and it's coming out through my IFS work. And then I take that data and I try to look back at all the tools that I have at my disposal and I you know, participate in that work through my own self care, if that mm, makes sense. That makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. So it's really using the other practices to help you with all the parts that may be showing up and then depleting those energy points or chi points or meridians or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's they're just symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The other thing that I will say is for people who practice yoga and mindfulness, the promise of a lot of the promise of these practices is often that uh, you'll learn a lot about yourself. You'll learn a lot about how you show up in the world and the things that trigger you, and you might uncover um, past material that you were previously unaware of. You might discover even if you don't have past trauma that you have unskillful habits that make your life more difficult because you're injecting unskillfulness into different relational moments, you know, mm. um, you know, the ways that we treat people in relationship in particular. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that the yoga methods and the mindfulness methods don't necessarily provide you with the tools for what happens next when you uncover mm -hmm. some difficult material. Yeah. And that's why I think IFS is a really helpful companion because it's not a secret that people go to meditation retreats and they come out with having confronted stuff that they were not prepared for and oh, not in the right moment to, to reckon with. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I went to a, I attended a, um, self-compassion retreat uh, here in Maryland with Kristen Neff and um, mm. Chris Germer. And being a therapist, and I was with some therapist friends, like we could, uh, you know, w working through the material on self-compassion, you could, s people would share their experiences. And you, I could just feel like, I was like, there's trauma there. They don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. I can feel it and hear it through their words and, you know, what there's without them specifically saying it. But I think that's so important to recognize that, yes, meditation, mindfulness, yeah, you're tapping into yourself and allowing these things to sort of surface, whether it's through your body or whatever it is. But yeah important to right. know. Yeah. So therapy, IFS, yes, can help with both those things. Yeah. So now I have with now that I have an IFS practitioner, I have because it's something I've been looking for for a long time. Like who are the people out there that understand the work that I'm doing and can reapply it in this therapeutic setting? Mm. And, you know, I would get little, oh, that person's a little bit mindful, that person. But it wasn't until I knew about IFS that I knew who to go look for specifically. And so whenever something is coming up in my practice, I take it to my coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I have that resource now that I didn't used to have. And I think that part of me held back on doing some deeper work, even in my, my meditation practice, because I knew I wasn't resourced to go there. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Good, good points all. Yes, there <laughs> needs to be some resourcing around any potential, yeah, trauma stuff that might be coming yeah, up. For sure. So uh, if there were tips or resources you felt were important for the listeners to know about, what might they be? Um, so let's see. For yin yoga, um, you know, anybody in the D.C. area can certainly look me up. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and I'll and, provide your website in the yeah. uh, show notes. But what is it? I forget. It's sati.yoga, S-A-T-I dot yoga. That, awesome. that leads to me. Cool. Um, but there is a resource by another yin teacher who happens to be based in Vancouver called yinyoga.com. And for anybody listening who is not uh, near me or Elizabeth, um, he has a, a directory of yin teachers around the world. So nice. you can find yin teachers that way. Um a book that I really love that unpacks Chinese medicine for uh, regular people like you and me would mm -hmm. be, uh, it's an old book, but it's still a, it's still a goodie, um, called Between Heaven and Earth. Mm. And I can send you a link with that so you can link to that as well. That would be great. Um, that's a really good introduction to um, how it matches up with Western viewpoints and also some practical ways of incorporating it into your, your daily life. Mm, nice. That's awesome. And uh, how do, so people find you through your website, but I mm -hmm. think you're on social media too. I am. I'm on Instagram at Sati Jen, S-A-T-I-J-E-N. Nice. And I think my Facebook is Sati Yoga Wellness. Nice. But if you did Sati Yoga, you'd find me on Facebook. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I so appreciate your taking the time, Jennifer. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> I know that it took us a while to, to <laughs> nail down a time and a date, and I'm so excited that we got to talk. Yeah. And I look forward to uh, maybe in the future, since we're relatively local, maybe we'll get to actually meet each other face-to-face. -face. I would love that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, thanks again for being on the Woman Warriors po podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs>